my name is Matthias, and I work on the V8 JavaScript engine at Google. Yeah, my name is Benedict. I also work on V8. What a coincidence. Hmm. Oh, surprise. Ah, That's and cool. we have the wrong focus. OK, now it works. Great. Technology, woohoo. Anyway, nowadays, JavaScript works not just on web browsers, but also on Node.js, on Electron, uh, React Native. There's uh, you know, even IoT devices. And I've heard that JavaScript even runs in space nowadays. Yep. So JavaScript is truly everywhere. And as a developer, learning JavaScript or investing your time in improving your JavaScript skills is a really good time investment. Let's take a look behind the scenes and find out how JavaScript engines work. So V8 is used in Google Chrome, but also in Node.js, in Electron, and some other embedders as well. And we've been speaking and writing quite a bit about how V8 works behind the scenes recently. But it's not just V8 out there. V8 is just one of the many JavaScript engines. Yes, yeah, so today we're going to look at some fundamentals that all JavaScript engines have in common. Uh, but we also look into some V8 specifics that might be interesting to you. <laughs> so among these other engines, there's SpiderMonkey, which is Mozilla's JavaScript engine. It's used in Firefox, and there's even a SpiderMonkey flavor of Node.js called SpiderNode. I really like that name, SpiderNode. SpiderNode. Yeah. Microsoft's JavaScript <laughs> engine is called Chakra, and the main part of the Chakra engine is open sourced as Chakra Core. There's even, well, Chakra Core. <laughs> <laughs> there's even a Node Chakra Core project that lets you run Node.js on top of Chakra instead of V8. I guess we have to keep some kind Maybe of- Maybe you go space. somewhere else. Like, yeah, OK, <laughs> No, 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 no. OK, uh, right on. OK, so Apple's JavaScript engine is called JSC, which stands for JavaScript Core. It's used in WebKit, Safari, and React Native. Native. Is it this one? No, it's not. Anyway, so those are the major JavaScript engines out there that are being used in web browsers. And if you ever want to play around with these engines directly, which is without having to go through a web browser or go through Node.js or some other embedder, then you can install the official binaries for all these engines by using a tool called JSVU. So you can just follow the installation instructions for the project. You can install it using npm. And then you will have all of these JavaScript engines installed in your system directly. And you can just invoke them from the command line just like you run Node. Um, but now that you have all those engines on your system, let's take a look at what they all have in common. And before we get into that, I guess it's time for a little disclaimer. Yeah, so now my microphone is off. <laughs> Use your outside voice. Okay, I'm <laughs> shouting now. So heads up, this, is, this might be a bit complicated and confusing because there's a lot of magic going on behind the scenes of JavaScript engines. But worry not, we walk through this together. <laughs> and even if you get a little lost, that's OK, <laughs> because we will highlight the key takeaways at the end of each section. All right, so let's start here. How does a JavaScript engine run the code that you write as a JavaScript developer? So that's where it starts, right? It takes your code, and then there's a parser that parses your source code, surprise, surprise, and it turns it into this thing called an abstract syntax tree, or an AST. Based on that AST, the interpreter can start to do its thing, which is to produce bytecode. And this bytecode can then run in that interpreter. And at that point, the engine is actually running your code. That's pretty cool. <coughs> but now, to make it run faster, the bytecode can be sent to an optimizer compiler, along with profiling data that is collected while it's running the code in the, in the interpreter. The optimizer compiler then speculates based on the profiling data that it has available, and it then produces highly optimized machine code based on those cases that it knows about. And if at some point one of those assumptions turns out to be incorrect, then we have to go back to the interpreter. And this is the process called de-optimizing. You may have heard of the term de-opt before, and in fact it's often used in the cor incorrect way, but this is what it means. If you have optimized code and you have to go back to interpreted codes, which is slightly slower, because one of the assumptions fails. Okay, so we learned that at a high level, all JavaScript engines have a lot in common. And their overall pipeline looks exactly the same. So, so. now let's zoom in on some of the parts that uh, actually run the code. So this yellow highlighted area where code gets interpreted and then optimized. And let's go over some of the differences between the major JavaScript engines in this area. So generally speaking, we saw that there is some kind of pipeline containing an interpreter and an optimizer compiler. And the interpreter generates bytecode, and the optimizer compiler produces highly optimized machine code, which is much faster. Yeah, and indeed, you pretty much described V8 here. 
So the interpreter in, in V8 is called Ignition, and it's responsible for generating and executing the bytecode. And while it runs the bytecode, it collects profiling data. And this profiling data can later be used to speed up the execution. Because when code becomes hot, so for example, when you run it a couple of times, uh, the bytecode and the profiling data together is sent to the optimizing compiler TurboFan, and TurboFan then generates highly optimized machine code based on the profiling data. And now SpiderMonkey does it a little bit differently from V8. They have not one, but two optimizing compilers. So their interpreter optimizes into their baseline compiler, which produces somewhat optimized code, but combined with profiling data that they gather while running the code, the IonMonkey compiler can kick in and produce heavily optimized code. If the speculative optimization fails, so we have to de-opt again, then IonMonkey falls back to the baseline code. Yeah, Chakra is very similar with two optimizing compilers. The interpreter optimizes into simple JIT, where JIT stands for just-in-time compiler, which produces somewhat optimized code. And then combined with profiling data that was collected earlier, the full JIT can produce more heavily optimized code. And then there's JSC, which really takes it to the extreme with not one, not two, but three different optimizing compilers. There's LLint, the low-level interpreter, which optimizes into their baseline compiler, which can then optimize into the DFG compiler, and from there it can go even further to the FDL compiler, and FDL stands for faster than light. No kidding. <laughs> now it stands for faster than light. Okay, so we just highlighted the main differences in the interpreter and optimizing compiler pipelines for each of these JavaScript engines. But what is the difference, what are the reasons for these differences? So why do some engines have more tiers than others? It turns out that there's a trade-off between quickly getting some code to run, so quick startup, or taking a little bit more time, but then getting code to run with optimal performance. So an interpreter can produce bytecode relatively quickly, but bytecode is generally not very efficient. On the other hand, an optimizing compiler takes a little bit longer to produce code, but eventually when it does, it produces highly optimized machine code that can run directly on the CPU. Yeah, as we've seen before, this is kind of the model that V8 uses. So we have the Ignition interpreter, which, by the way, is the fastest of all the interpreters in all engines <laughs> in terms of raw execution speed. And then there is the TurboFan optimizing compiler, which takes a while, but eventually generates highly optimized machine code. So this trade-off is one of the main reasons why some JavaScript engines choose to add extra optimization tiers in between, like we saw before. So for example, SpiderMonkey has their baseline tier in between the interpreter and their full optimizing compiler called IonMonkey. And the interpreter generates bytecode pretty quickly, but the bytecode runs pretty slow. Then baseline takes a little bit longer to generate its code, but it offers better runtime performance. But finally, the IonMonkey optimizing compiler takes the longest to produce machine code, but once that code arrives, it can run very efficiently. Okay, so let's take a look at a concrete example and uh, see how the different pipelines deal with this. So here's some code that gets repeated often in a hot loop. It's really nonsensical, but it doesn't matter. It does get repeated often. Yeah. It does get repeated often, very often. So V8 starts uh, running the bytecode in Ignition, our interpreter, and at some point the engine determines that the code is hot and starts up the TurboFan frontend. And the TurboFan frontend is the part of TurboFan that deals with integrating the profiling data and constructing a basic machine representation of your code. And this basic machine representation is then sent to the TurboFan optimizer on a different thread for further improvements of the code. And while the optimizer is running, we can continue executing the bytecode in Ignition. And at some point, the optimizer is done, and we have executable machine code, and the execution can continue with that. And there's SpiderMonkey, which also starts in the interpreter. It always starts there. But it has the additional baseline component, which means hot code is first sent to the baseline. And the baseline compiler generates baseline code on the main thread. And it continues execution once it's ready. If baseline code is run for a while, then SpiderMonkey eventually fires up the IonMonkey frontend. And then it kicks off the optimizer very similarly to the way it works in V8. So the old code kind of keeps running in baseline while IonMonkey is still optimizing. And when, once that optimized code arrives, then the optimized code starts to be executed instead of that baseline code. Okay, Chakra is very similar to SpiderMonkey from its basic architecture. So Chakra tries to do more things concurrently, though, without avo uh, or avoid 
to avoid blocking the main thread. And instead of running any part of the compiler on the main thread, Chakra copies out the bytecode and the profiling data that the compiler likely needs and sends it to a dedicated compiler process. And when a code is ready, uh, wait, right, sends it to the process, sorry. So when the code is ready, the engine starts running the simple JIT code. And we do the same, or they do the same for full JIT. And the benefit of this approach is that the pause times where the copy happens are usually much shorter than running the full compiler front end on the main thread. But the downside of this approach is that the copy heuristic might actually miss some information that would be required for certain optimizations. So it's essentially trading code quality for latency. Uh, what we observed, though, is that in the vast majority of cases, this is still a net win. And we're actually looking into adopting a similar system for V8. And then, as usual, JSC kind of takes it to the extreme. All their compilers went fully concurrently with the main JavaScript execution. <laughs> And there's no copy phase at all. Instead, the main thread merely triggers compilation jobs on another thread. The compilers then use a very complicated locking scheme to access profiling data from the main thread. And the advantage of this approach is that it reduces jank on the main thread. The downside, of course, is that it requires dealing with very complex multi-threading systems and like paying some locking costs for various operations. Yeah, that's why I like to call this the adventurous approach to JavaScript optimization. It's adventurous, but it works for them. It works. Now, we've talked about the trade-off between generating code quickly, like with an interpreter, and generating quick code, like with an optimizer compiler. But there's another dimension to this trade-off, which is memory usage. To illustrate that, here's a simple JavaScript program that is used to add two numbers together. So let's take a look at the bytecode that we generate for the add function using the ignition interpreter in V8. And I don't want you to worry about the exact bytecode or to even try and read it. The point is that it's just four instructions. And when the code becomes hot, then Turbofan generates the following highly optimized machine code. Let's take a look at that. Again, I'm not expecting anyone to read this, of course. Uh, but the, the thing is, this particular optimized machine code only handles the case of integer numbers because that's all that the optimizing compiler has seen when it was collecting uh, profiling feedback. And even for that, we already need a lot more code than those four instructions in the interpreter, which handles all cases. So in general, bytecode tends to be a lot more compact than machine code, especially optimized machine code. And on the other hand, bytecode needs an interpreter to run, whereas the optimized machine code can run directly on the processor. Yeah, and this is one of the main reasons why JavaScript engines don't just optimize everything. <laughs> because as we saw earlier, generating optimized machine code takes a long time. And on top of that, we just learned that it also requires more memory to store the optimized machine code. So in summary, the reason that JavaScript engines have different optimization tiers is because of a fundamental trade-off between generating code quickly, like with an interpreter, or generating quick code, like with an optimizing compiler. It's a scale, and adding more optimization tiers in between allows you to make more fine-grained decisions at the cost of additional implementation complexity and overhead. But in general, there's, uh, well, in addition, there's a trade-off between the optimization level and the memory usage of the generated code. And that is why JavaScript engines only optimize hot code. OK, so now we've seen the basic architecture of all JavaScript engines and kind of talked about what they have in common and how they differ. But let's dive deeper into some of the details. Specifically, let's look into how <coughs> JavaScript engines implement the JavaScript object model and which tricks they use to speed up things like accessing properties off of objects. As it turns out, all major engines implement this very similarly. OK, but Matthias, isn't it the case that all objects in the JavaScript spec are essentially just dictionaries? Uh, that's roughly right, yeah. So any plain old JavaScript object is essentially a dictionary with string keys that map to what the spec calls property attributes. So let's take a look at how that works. So the X and the Y are string keys in a dictionary. And I always used to think that objects in JavaScript, they are keys that map to values. But apparently, there's a little bit more to it. It's not just the value that it maps to. It maps to this whole bucket of property attributes. And here are the property attributes that the spec defines. Other than the value itself, it also defines the attributes writable, which determines whether the property can be reassigned to. There's also enumerable, which determines whether the property shows up in four in loops. And there's configurable, which determines whether the property can be deleted. And you can actually get to these property attributes directly for any object and property by using the object.getOwnPropertyDescriptor API in JavaScript. 
Interesting. So that's how JavaScript defines objects. But yeah, and if we look at JavaScript programs in the wild, then accessing properties is by far the most common and important operation. So it's crucial for JavaScript engines to make that fast. Yeah, I think it's also the case that in many JavaScript programs, there a lot of objects actually look very similar. So they kind of have the same property keys, I guess. Right. So, so in, in a sense, it's like the same shape. Yes. In those cases, we say that they, these objects have the same shape because they have exactly the same property keys. So with that in mind, JavaScript engines can actually optimize based on this shape of an object. And let's take a look at how that works exactly. OK, so let's assume we have this object with the properties x and y. And it uses this dictionary data structure that we saw before. It contains the keys as strings, and those point to their respective property attributes. Now, if you access a property, for example, in this case, if you write object.y, then the JavaScript engine has to look into the object for the key y, then load its corresponding property attributes, and from that, finally return its value. But where are these property attributes stored in memory? Do we store all of them as part of the JS object itself? Uh, if we assume that we'll be seeing more objects with this shape later, then it would be wasteful to do so, because all that property value information would be repeated. Like, the only things that differ between different objects are the values, but if we know that properties are the same, because they share the same shape, we would waste a lot of memory if we duplicate all that information. Right. And as an optimization, engines store the shape of the object separately. So this shape contains all the property names and the attributes, except for their values. Instead, the shape basically contains the offset where the values can be found inside of the objects, so that the JavaScript engine knows how to get to the values. Now, every object with the same shape points to exactly the same shape instance, and it only has to store the values that are unique to this in the object. So the benefit becomes clear when we have multiple objects. No matter how many objects you have, as long as they have the same shape, we only need to store the shape and property information once. And all JavaScript engines essentially use this as an optimization. Hmm. OK, and that sounds pretty cool. But it seems like a common thing to add properties to existing objects in JavaScript programs, right? Yeah. So what happens if you have an object with a certain shape, and then you add a property to it? How does the JavaScript engine find this new shape? Yeah, the trick here is that these shapes form so-called transition chains. And here's an example of that. So the object starts out without any properties, so it points to the empty shape. Now, the next statement adds the property x to this with a value of 5. So the JavaScript engine transitions to a shape that contains the property x, and a value of 5 is added to the object at the first offset 0. And this is recorded in the property information. The next line adds the property y. So the JavaScript engine transitions to yet another shape that contains both x and y and appends the value 6 to the JavaScript object at offset 1. Looking at this, it's clear that we don't even need to store the full table of properties for each shape. Instead, every shape only needs to know about the new property that it introduces. Oh, I see. We, we don't have to store the information about x in that last shape because it can already be found earlier in the chain. True. And the trick is that every shape links back to its previous shape. So if you, in this example, write something like o.x, then the JavaScript engine looks up the property x by walking up the transition chain until it finds the shape that introduces x. OK, so what if you have two empty objects, and then you add a different property to each of them? Then there's no way to chain these shapes together. So how does that work? Indeed. So in that case, we have to branch. And instead of a chain, we end up with a so-called transition tree. So here, we create the empty object first, and then we add a property x to it. We end up with the JavaScript object containing a single value with two shapes, the empty shape and the shape with only property x. Now, the second example starts with an empty object too, but it then adds a different property y. So in total, we end up with two shape chains and a total of three shapes. Gotcha. So all JavaScript engines use these shapes as an optimization. And do these shape transitions always correspond to a new property being added? Yeah, that would be nice, but uh, no. <laughs> so there are special transitions. For example, there are instance migrations, as well as extensibility and integrity level changes. Whoa, wait a minute. What, what are you talking about? What are these words even? Like? It's confusing, right? <laughs> it <laughs> is confusing. It is, I, know, I know. So I think we have to unpack that a little bit. Yeah, we need a little bit more background on this. Actually, we did not more background, but we have some time left. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, you know JavaScript has types, right? Despite often being cited as an untyped language. So you're saying I can npm uninstall TypeScript now? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I like TypeScript. But still, I know there's a couple of types in JavaScript. There's things like numbers, string, objects, whatever. Right. There's probably some more, right? True, yeah. We have exactly eight by now. So we have number, string, symbol, big end, boolean, undefined, null, and object. And you can think of these types as boxes or sets in the mathematical sense. So every possible JavaScript value has to live in exactly one of these boxes. And within these eight types, we have two main groups. The blue ones are the so-called primitives. And, well, the green box, this is the objects. Right, that makes sense. Well, five years ago, the symbol and big in boxes didn't exist yet. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and it's possible that in the future we will have more boxes there, but the fundamental distinction between primitives and objects is going to remain. That's interesting. And I noticed that null is a box of its own, so it's not in the object box. Yeah, that's correct. But if you do type of null in JavaScript, I'm pretty sure JavaScript tells you that null is an object. Uh, yeah, that's because type of is a liar. <laughs> so what's the story behind that? How am I supposed to remember this? Okay, so the story I heard is closely related to the story of null versus undefined in JavaScript. Uh, Brandon Icke, the inventor of JavaScript, logically divided the set of all JavaScript values into two categories, with primitives on one side and objects on the other side. So primitives are things like symbols, as well as undefined, null, as well as any strings or numbers or big ins or booleans that appear as literals within the source code. And then all other values, such as those created using constructors mostly, are objects in JavaScript. Yeah, correct. Uh, this is very similar to Java, where Brandon took inspiration also because maybe he wanted to, or he was forced to rename it to JavaScript for reasons. Anyways, but just think in Java, his idea was that null is supposed to be the no object marker. So in, in a more a theoretical sense, this is like the bottom element of the uh, object lattice. But Brendan also saw the need to have a general bottom element sitting underneath all actual values. And that's why we have undefined in addition to null in JavaScript. Totally not confusing. Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess I suppose that kind of makes sense. I, that's why type of returns object for everything on the right side. There. Exactly, yes. Right. So I, I guess null and undefined actually make sense to me now. Uh, but how is this related to those special transitions that you were talking about? Yeah, that needs even more background to explain. Okay, so uh, let's talk about 42 for a second. Oh, I know about 42. I know 42 is a number, and I know even JavaScript considers it to be a number. Right, so here type of is actually correct. Awesome. Great. Uh, but the JavaScript type of a value uh, is separate from how the engine represents that value in memory. So specifically, 42 being an integer number, there are several different ways to represent that in memory. One of the most commonly used representations and computers nowadays is the so-called tooth complement. It uses a base two factorization to map the number to individual bits, where each bit position corresponds to a factor of two. And tooth complement works with different word sizes, where word is a fixed size piece of data that gets handled as a single unit. And the exact number of bits in a word depends on the CPU architecture. One very common size here is 32 bit. But tooth complement is not the only number representation that computers understand. In the early days of computers, binary coded decimals were very popular, especially for financial applications. But nowadays, they aren't really used anymore, though. So it's Instead, kind of a hipster representation nowadays. It's the hipster financial thing, ah, yeah. There we go. Right. OK, so instead, nowadays, floating point representations are very common. And floating point representations can represent a wide range of numbers, and not just fixed point decimals and integers. And one particular instance of that is the so-called float32 representation. An even more popular instance of this is float64, which uses 64 bits and can thus represent a much bigger set of floating point values. Float64 is commonly referred to as double precision floating point, while float32 is often called single uh, precision floating point. So you might have heard about doubles before. This is just float64. And ECMAScript chooses uh, numbers to be 64-bit floating-point values. So does that mean that JavaScript engines have to store numbers as float64 all the time? Yeah, that would be a really terrible idea, because this is just terribly inefficient. Uh, engines have some freedom to choose internal representations, 
as long as the observable behavior matches that of float64. Okay, but how do JavaScript engines even figure out which numbers to specifically optimize for and to store separately? Okay, let's look at common numbers in JavaScript programs. 42 is maybe one of them. But uh, more interestingly, a lot of numbers in JavaScript programs are actually integer values. Ah, and not only that, I mean, 42 is also an integer number that can be used as a valid array index in JavaScript. And accessing an array element by its index like this is very common in JavaScript programs. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen that. Interestingly, not just any integer value is a valid array index in JavaScript. The ECMAScript spec defines an array index as any integer number in the range from 0 to 2 to the power of 32 minus 2. Okay, so array indices are limited to the 32-bit range? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so how can JavaScript engines use this information to optimize code that accesses array elements by index? How do engines make that fast? Well, for the processor to do any memory access operation, the index has to be available in two's complement anyways. Oh, so you're saying that this particular representation is ideal for array indices then. But what would happen if we represented array indices as float64, though? Well, you can do this, but then you have to convert back and forth between float64 and two's complement on every, every time you want to access an error element. Okay, yeah, that, that does sound pretty terrible and wasteful and very slow. So is this alternate number representation of two's complement only useful for arrays specifically? Uh, no. So there are a lot more benefits to this particular representation. Uh, in general, processors execute integer operations much faster than floating point operations. So you're saying that the loop at the top is more efficient than the loop at the bottom, even though it's very similar, just because of the way CPUs work? Yeah, yeah I would guess the uh, bottom one is easy, easily twice as slow as the top one. Wow. And I suppose the same is true for other operations then, like the modulo operator. I would expect the performance of this code then to depend on whether you're dealing with integers or not. Correct. So if both operands in this case are represented as integers, the CPU can uh, compute the result very efficiently. So V8 even has a fast path for the case where the divisor is a power of 2, which is even faster than the general case. But if you have these values represented as floats, then the comp uh, computation is much more complex and takes a lot longer, like orders of magnitude longer. <laughs> so then it sounds like engines should just always use this two's complement representation for all integers and any operations on them, all the results of them. Yeah, ideally, yes. But of course, JavaScript puts some limitations on you. Oh, right, yeah. You mentioned that before. Yeah, so JavaScript Senna does this on float64. And certain integer operations can actually produce floats or have floating point semantics. And it's important that the JavaScript engine produces the correct result here. Right. So one example here is that flow64 has a safe integer range of 53 bits. So once you go outside of that range, you must lose precision <coughs> to properly implement the ECMAScript spec. Float64 also supports negative zeros. So negative 1 times 0 has to be negative 0. But there's no way to represent negative 0 in two's complement representation. OK, but nitpicking a bit, this would actually also be triple equal to 0. Yes. Negative 0 is triple equals to positive 0. But there are cases where the difference between these two values is observable. For example, if you use object.is in JavaScript. And float64 also has infinities. So 1 divided by 0 would be infinity, and negative 1 divided by 0 would be negative infinity. Or 1 divided by negative 0 would also be negative infinity. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> ah, the best thing is yet to come. So uh, float64 also has a non, which is not a number, which confusingly is actually a number, but it says it's not. Uh, so 0 divided by 0 actually yields none with float64 semantics. So th the point is here that all these operations cannot be performed by using only 32 bits two's complement, because all the values on the right are floats, even though all the values on the left-hand side are integers. Yeah, so JavaScript engines have to take special care to make sure that integer operations fall back appropriately to produce these fancy float64 results. So how does V8 deal with that? OK, so let's look into V8 specifics here. So V8 uses a technique called pointer tagging to represent arbitrary values where the type is only known at runtime. Because even though JavaScript is typed, there is no static type checking. We only learn at runtime. So specifically for small integers in the 31-bit signed integer range, V8 uses a special representation called SMI for small integer. 
Oh, okay, so all the numbers we see here are all SMIs because they're all integers and they're all within that 31-bit range. Got it. So what about numbers that don't fit within this range? Anything that is not representable as a SMI is represented as a heap object, which is the address of some entity in memory. And specifically for numbers, we use a special kind of heap object, the so-called heap number, to represent numbers that aren't inside the SMI range. Okay, so some numbers in JavaScript are represented as SMIs, but other numbers are represented as these heap numbers. Okay, got it. And you're saying that V8 is specifically optimized for these SMI things. Right, because as we saw earlier, small integers are really common in JavaScript, and SMIs don't need to be allocated as dedicated entities in memory, and also in evil faster integer operations in general. Okay, so we learned that even values with the very same JavaScript type can be represented in completely different ways behind the scenes of the JavaScript engine as an optimization. And here's a little bit more about how that works <coughs> under the hood. So let's say you have an object with two fields, x and y, and the value 42 for x can be rep represented as a SMI, so it can be stored inside of the object directly, whereas the 4.2 needs a separate entity to hold the value because it's a float, and the object points to that entity. Now, changing the value of x can happen in place because the new value 52 also happens to fit the SMI range. Right, but if we do the same to the y field, and we end up, or if we add 1 to y, then we end up with 5.2, and it does not fit into a SMI. And it's also different from the previous value, which was 4.2, so V8 has to allocate a new heap number entity for the assignment to y. So these heap numbers are not mutable? No, 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 they're immutable data structures. So that means we can actually, when we do an assignment of y's value to x, we can just link to the same heap number because it's immutable. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's the benefit in that, I guess. But if these heap numbers are immutable, isn't that going to be very slow if you update fields with values outside of the SMI range? Like, let's say you run this loop, which starts out with a double value for x, and then you keep on incrementing it. Then you create lots of new double values. So wouldn't that look like this initially, like we've seen this before? Yeah. Uh, just you have the value x, the, the property x, and that points to some location in memory. But then if you run the loop, it would create five new heap number instances along the way, leaving behind five of these garbage entities that need to be collected and removed by the garbage collector. Yeah, this is indeed a major problem for uh, implementations using this pointer tagging technique. And specifically, the garbage collector is usually not very happy with this kind of trashing. So, so, I mean, wouldn't it be cheaper to just do the same thing that we do for SMIs or do something similar where we can update the non-SMI fields <coughs> in place? Yeah, this is kind of what V8 does under the hood for you as an optimization. So when you have numeric fields that also hold values outside of the SMI range, and then V8 marks those fields as double on the shape. So we get a new field in the property information or we store the representation. And it also allocates a so-called mutable heap number that holds the value encoded as a float64. Now, when you update the field, V8 no longer <coughs> needs to allocate a new heap number, but instead can just update the value of the mutable heap number in place. Yeah, that actually makes sense to me. So what's, what's the catch with this approach? Why wouldn't we do this? Right, uh, we do, but uh, there's a catch, yeah. <laughs> so since the the value of a mutable heap number can change since it's mutable. It's important that these are not passed around, that these values are not being passed around oh, like this. Oh, right. Like if you do something like you assign o.x to some new variable y, then you wouldn't want the value of y to change the next time you update o.x because that would be a violation of the JavaScript spec. Yeah, and it would be highly confusing. Right, <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. Okay, more. yeah, right. So that means when you access o.x now, the number must be reboxed into a regular heap, nu heap number object before you can assign it to y. You cannot just share the mutable heap number there. Okay, so for floats, I will remember that V8 performs all this magic behind the scenes. But for small integers, it would be wasteful to go with this mutable heap number approach because SMIs are more efficient to represent. Yeah, right, and the good news is we don't even have to. <laughs> all we have to do for small integers is to mark the field on the property information as a SMI and we can just update the number in place as long as the new value also fits into the SMI range. Right, gotcha, yeah, that makes sense. So what if a field initially contains a SMI, but then eventually it has to hold a number outside of the SMI range? Uh, like in this case, there's two objects, both using the same shape, where 
x is represented as a smi originally, a small integer. And I suppose that would look something like this. We've seen this before. Correct. So we have these two objects pointing to the same shape where x is marked as my representation. And now when changing b dot x to a double representation, v8 allocates this new shape where x is assigned double representation and which points back to the empty shape. In addition, we also allocate a mutable heap number to hold the new value, 0.2, for the x property. And then we update the object b to use this new shape and change the slot in the object to point to the mutable heap number instead of the smi that was in there before. Then last, we mark the old shape as deprecated and unlink it from the transition, chain, uh, transition tree. And this is done by having a new transition from the empty shape for x to the newly allocated shape. Uh, we cannot completely remove the deprecated shape as we see because a still points to it and it would be way too expensive to uh, traverse the whole memory to find all potential objects that still hold on to the old shape and update them eagerly. Instead, v8 updates them lazily, meaning the next property access or assignment to a, so you don't even need to assign any access is fine, is going to migrate to the new shape first. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here and it's honestly it's a little bit overwhelming and confusing, but I think the main idea is to make the deprecated shape unreachable so that the garbage collector can then remove it. Correct, yes. Right, okay. So what if the field that changes its representation is not the last one in the chain? That seems even more tricky. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> okay, so in that case, what we have to do is we need to find what we call the split shape which is the last shape in the chain before the relevant property gets introduced. In our example, we are changing y, so we need to find the last shape that doesn't have y on it, which is, happens to be the shape that, has x, uh, that introduced x. So then starting from the split shape, we create a new transition chain for y, which replace all the previous transitions on the old chain, but uh, on the way we mark y as double representation. And we use this new transition chain for y and mark, just mark the old subtree as deprecated. And in the last step, migrate the instance O to this new object and use a mutable heap number to hold the value of y now. So any new objects that are created with, will not take this old path. And once all the reference to the old shape are gone, then the deprecated shape part of the tree will disappear. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. So. In summary, engines try to automatically find optimal property value representations for you. And now I'm really curious about those extensibility and integrity level transitions you were talking about earlier. What is that about? Is it related to things like object dot prevent extensions? Yeah, or object seal, object freeze, oh, like okay. these fancy things. Okay. Maybe you want to say something about that? Sure. So object dot prevent extensions is this JavaScript API that prevents new properties from ever being added to a certain object. If you try to add a property, it throws an exception. It wouldn't actually throw an exception in if you're not in strict mode, uh, but it would still silently fail. It wouldn't actually add the property. And then there's object.seal, which does the same thing as prevent extensions, but it also marks all properties as non-configurable, meaning you cannot delete them or change any of their property attributes like enumerability, configurability, or writability. And then there's object.freeze, which is the most extreme of the three APIs. Uh, it does the same thing as seal, but it also prevents the values of existing properties from ever being changed. It makes them non-writable. So let's consider this concrete example with two objects, which both have a single property X, and where we then prevent any further extensions to that second object. So it starts out like we already know, transitioning from the empty shape to a new shape that holds the property X. And in this case, it's represented as a smi. And now comes the magical part where we prevent extensions to this object B. Yeah, it's, oh, it's not really magical. It's just a bit special. So now we have a new kind of transition that goes, uh, has this marker non-extensible on it. And it essentially just transitions to a new shape that is marked as non-extensible. And this special transition doesn't introduce a new property. It's really just a marker that something changed on the object. Uh, also notice that we cannot just update the shape with x in place since this is still used by a and a was supposed to be extensible. So we cannot just mark this shape as non-extensible. Okay, so let's put all of this together and use what we learned to understand this recent React issue. 
when the React team profiled a real-world application, they spotted a performance problem in React score. And as we explained before, um, they, they thought this was a deopt. It's not actually a deopt because it, all, it happened in interpreted code, so even code that was not yet optimized. Uh, and instead, this was just an auth performance cliff in V8. Now, let's start out with this simplified repro for the bug. Uh, we have an object with two fields that have a SMI representation, and then we prevent any further extensions to the object. And eventually, we force the second <coughs> field to a double representation instead of SMI. Yeah, as we learned before, we'll end up with, with roughly this setup. So specifically, both properties are marked as my representation, and the final transition in the chain is the extensibility transition, which marks this object as non-extensible. So now, now we need to find, uh, now we need to change y to double representation, which means we need to start again by finding the split shape. In this case, it's the shape that introduced x. But unfortunately, V8 got highly confused now because uh, the split shape was extensible while the current shape was marked as non-extensible. And V8 didn't really know how to replay transitions properly in this case. So what happened here was V8 just essentially gave up trying to make sense of this and was like, uh, whatever. It, instead, it just created a separate shape that is tailored towards this object and is not connected to any existing shape tree in the system or not used by any other objects. So you can think of this as kind of an orphan shape, a sad shape. Yeah. I don't know, whatever. No one likes this shape. It's just sitting there alone, except for the object. The object likes it, OK. But uh, you can imagine that if this uh, happens to lots of objects, that this is pretty bad because it renders the whole shape system useless. So in the case of React, here's what happened. Each fiber node has a couple of fields that are supposed to hold timestamps when profiling is turned on. And they are initialized with 0 or minus 1, so they start out with SMI representation. But then later, actual timestamps are added in these fields, and the values that they use come from performance.now, which returns floating point values. So those are stored as doubles, <coughs> which means these fields now go to a double representation because they no longer fit into a SMI. And on top of that, React also prevents extensions to these fiber node instances. Yeah, so initially, the simplified example above looked like this. So we have two instances sharing a shape tree and all working as intended. This is perfect. But then uh, as you store the real timestamp value, V8 got confused finding the split shape and it assigns a new orphan shape to node one. The same happens to node two sometime later. And in the end, we just ended up with two of these sad orphan islands where, yeah. yeah. I mean, many real-world React apps have tens of thousands of these fiber nodes, not just two. So I imagine that's not going to make, make V8 particularly happy in this case. No, V8 was really, really upset with React in this case. Hmm. Yeah, but worry not. We have fixed this since then. So the problem, at least the problem with the prevent extensions is gone. And we can now, with the fix, V8 does the right thing. So we, again, have these two fiber node instances point to the non-extensible shape. And actual start time is a SMI. But upon the first assignment to actual uh, start time to node 1, a new transition chain is created. And uh, the previous chain is marked as deprecated. And specifically, uh, we can now properly replay the non-extensible uh, transition on the new chain. And eventually, after assigning to node 2 dot actual start time, the second fiber node also migrated to the new map, uh, to the new shape. And the deprecated part of the transition tree can be cleaned up by the garbage collector. Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, the React team mitigated this problem um, in the meantime by making sure that all the time and duration fields on fiber nodes start out with double representation. And this can be achieved quite easily by just assigning number none, which they took here. But I know Matthias completely doesn't like this. Yeah, I think none is very confusing to use here. I mean. I learned today that it's, used, that it's represented as a double, but you could use any other floating point value. You could do something like number.min value, or you could just have a 0.1 literal. That's maybe the most obvious way of doing this. You could use any other sensible floating point value there as the very first value for the field. That's the point. Now, it's worth pointing out that the concrete React bug was V8 specific, and in general, you shouldn't optimize for any specific version of any specific JavaScript engine but it's nice to have a handle in case things don't work out. 
And more importantly, um, so what you can do here is the very first value that you assign to the field has to have the correct representation. But right after that, as you can see at the bottom, you can just reassign it to something else. And in this case, we reassign to zero, which is a SMI. But by then, the engine has already learned to use the right representation behind the scenes. Now, more importantly, keep in mind that the engine does a lot of magic under the hood, as we've seen today. And you can help it by not mixing types, if possible. So for example, this is a similar example. Should, you shouldn't initialize your numeric fields with null, because that would disable all the benefits from all the field representation tracking altogether. And the, the most important part of this, in my opinion, is that it actually makes your code more readable as well. Uh, so yeah, so in general, I would say write readable code and performance will follow. <laughs> right, yeah, so um, yeah. initialize your fields with a value that is similar to the value it will eventually get. Sensible value. Makes sense. Okay, but uh, as mentioned before, we already fixed the issue with the extensibility transition. And right now we are looking into making field representation changes cheaper in general and removing the remaining performance cliffs specifically, maybe even around the double fields. So in summary, you can help engines to find optimal property value representations by initializing your fields with a similar value. Because that way your fields get the proper representation right from the start. Choose your initializers wisely, man. Yep, that's, that's good advice. Okay, well, that was a lot of information. Maybe let's take a deep breath. And now we can continue with the second half of the talk. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Just kidding. No, no. Uh, now, I mean, we've learned a lot about JavaScript engine internals today, and we got some actual coding advice out of it as well. So let's recap the main takeaways, because all those details are not really too important. It's all about the takeaways. At a high level, we learned that JavaScript engines have a lot in common, but they differ in their optimization <coughs> pipeline. And the reason for this is that because of fundamental trade-offs between generating code quickly, like with an interpreter, or generating quick code, like with an optimizer compiler. Yeah, and there's another trade-off between the optimization level of your code and the memory usage that, you need, that the code has. And that's why JavaScript engines usually only optimize hot code, ideally. We also learned that JavaScript objects are essentially just string key dictionaries on a high level. But to optimize object storage and operations on those objects, JavaScript engines use shapes internally. That means that JavaScript distinguishes between primitives and objects as well, and we also learned that type of is a liar. Uh, we also saw that even values with the same JavaScript type can have different representations behind the scenes. We even got some nice performance advice out of all this, which is to always initialize your objects in the same way so that they can share the same shape and our shape system can be effective. You should also make sure to choose sensible initial values for your fields to help the engine with representation selection. Yeah, and that's it for us. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Benedict and Matthias. Um, we are a little bit late in the schedule because we started uh, a little bit late. So um, should we do the Q&A? Yeah, so maybe let's, um, let's have a Q&A, a few questions. Just raise your hands if you have a question. <coughs> Hi, great talk, thanks. Um, <laughs> oh. Okay, cool. Um, so JavaScript is increasingly becoming typed with Flow and uh, TypeScript. Would there, I mean, can you see that becoming useful for engines if that information was included? And could the, the optimizing compiler somehow use that to speed up <coughs> compiling the code? Uh, well, there's a long answer and a short answer. The short answer is no. <laughs> and the long answer starts with no. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a comma and because. So uh, the main reason is, A, uh, well, you still need to interface with all this legacy JavaScript. This will not disappear because that's the main benefit of JavaScript. When you remove the ecosystem, then you remove most of the benefit for JavaScript. So uh, the engine still needs to support this untyped uh, world. And the second reason is that um, type checking, since the thing is, you, you, the, the type of the object doesn't tell you what shape it has. 
So the engine still has to check the shape. And by actually also adding a type system on top, you need to check the shapes and the types. So by that, you actually add more overhead. And um, the Microsoft Chakra team did an experiment at some point just using number, I think they used number type information, passed through and uh, turned this into hard checks. And they, at the very best, removing all the safety checks, they got 10% out of this. This is without any safety, so you can just crash right ahead immediately. Um, and given these results, we don't really see that this, I, we think that types are a developer feature. It enables a lot more developer productivity, but it's not about performance in the engine. Um, does this tip with the initial value initialization also help with other engines, or is this V8 specific? This is general advice, and, and I think um, what's the most important for me, because I, I don't want to optimize for any specific engine or for specific engine quirks even, uh, but most of the time this actually makes your code more readable as well. Like uh, if you have a field and you know you're going to store a number value there, then it, it makes sense to me that I initialize it as zero instead of null or undefined or something like that. Uh, and in, in some way, like the, the trick to initialize your field with a double value, it, it kind of follows from that in a way. And Benedict, maybe you want to talk about JSC? Um, yeah, so other engines work slightly differently. Um, for example, JSC doesn't track the information on, uh, so Apple's engine, doesn't track the information on the shapes. But instead, what it does is on every property access, it records the representation of the things that it has seen. So that also means if you, if you have properties that have sometimes nulls, sometimes numbers, sometimes something, then when they, as they get to optimize code, they will be like, yeah, I've seen everything, uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, better stick to what you want to have in there and not mix types. So it does help other engines as well, but I think the most important thing is that you should focus on code readability in general. This conference has been gradually getting better for me. The quality of the lineup is usually really, really good. And this is something I'm really saying thumbs up. They're really try to get speakers here that are pushing to the future of web technologies. I just feel like it's a very community-driven conference. It also is a lot of quality and people are just nice. Hi, my name is Sarah, and this is Asian Conf in Dortmund. Amazing venue, Austria is beautiful. Meeting all of the people in the community and getting to go and hang out and ski.